workplace is anywhere work or duty is performed. And that includes hospitals, marketplaces, restaurants, homes, and even online. Um, a waitress being fondled by a customer or her boss is being sexually harassed at work. In the same vein, an online influencer receiving unsolicited sex-oriented comments or nude photos is being sexually harassed at work. Growing up, being sent to the market personally was like being sent to battle. You, I mean, if you remember, I, I think most women in Nigeria and probably many parts of West Africa will remember that if you're going to the market, you'd have to wear jeans. I had to wear jeans. Um, you just had to guard up, you know, because people groped you. Market women often tolerate ugling and taunts from their male counterparts and sometimes even their customers. Sometimes it gets physical. They throw insults at you, they grab you, they mock you, they tell you, ah, they have, you have, I have two of you at home, why are you not interested? So our society has convinced us that this is normal. The US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission defines sexual harassment as unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature that interferes with one's employment or work performance or creates a hostile or offensive work environment. This definition is particularly important as it situates sexual harassment in a neutral context, allowing it to be anchored to any workplace. In structured workplaces such as offices, power imbalance and organizational complacency reinforce sexual harassment, assault, and other forms of violence against women. In less structured workplaces, spaces that are more fluid, many things contribute to the power imbalance. The financial agency of men in comparison to women, physical strength, and I think importantly, perceived superiority of standing in society and a lack of widespread social awareness reinforces this problem. So the goal of this learning session is to challenge our understanding of violence against women in all workplaces, explore its various forms and its prevalence in our society. For African women to advance entrepreneurially in their respective workplaces, in their homes, in corporate leadership roles, really in every strata of society, strategies need to be put in place to facilitate safety at work. The first step towards facilitating those strategies is understanding the true nature of the problem and its level of integration within our society and institutions. Only then can actual measures achieve what we want them to. Without, you know, speaking, taking, grabbing the microphone and keeping it too long, I want to say a huge thank you to our distinguished speakers for being here and to all our guests for joining us today. Thank you to Funke Noye from the Ford Foundation team for making this event possible. And of course, to the crew at AWB for all their work at the back end. I'm really looking forward to joining the sessions and the discussions and learning from the insights shared from our distinguished speakers. Thank you so much. Funke, over to you. Thank you very much, Nkira. I want to welcome you all once again to the Women, Violence and the Workplace Learning Session by Ford Foundation in collaboration with the African Women on Board. Our goal with this session, as Nkiru has summarized, is to bridge the significant gap in understanding uh, the extent of workplace violence, its effects on the well-being and productivity of women, and of course, find a way to explore new or existing practices that would then help us to curb uh, this challenge. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Ford Foundation is doing this, as you know, uh, with Africa Women on Board, and this is part of a quarterly learning series of the foundation even though this one is specifically going to focus on violence against women, uh, it's part of our activities to commemorate the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. We all know that sexual harassment involves the unwanted imposition of sexual gratification in the context of a relationship on unequal power. It's a huge societal problem that bedevils all workplaces all over the world, whether formal or informal, and it has significant and severe consequences to victims and organization. Sexual harassment and assault affects women globally and across all socioeconomic levels. In the US, for example, over 60% of women reported being sexually harassed at work. 
in the European Union, 55% of women declared having been sexually harassed at least once, and 75% of women in a professional capacity or in top management jobs have experienced sexual harassment in their lifetime. If we come down to Nigeria, about half of women in workplaces have at least once experienced sexual harassment at the workplace. The most common of these, uh, you know, is the quid pro quo, where female workers, you know, have been approached to give sexual favors in return for employment advances. Almost every woman in Nigeria would have a story to tell in this regard. Uh, even though there is no statutory definition of sexual harassment, at least not that we know, we would know from the experts in this conversation. However, it is one of the dimensions of workplace insecurity faced by employees in different sectors. Combating sexual harassment and assault in workplaces is therefore a global concern uh, necessitating the ILO Convention 190 on the Elimination, and ILO is the International Labour Organization, Convention 190 on the Elimination of Violence and Harassment in the World of Work during the organization's general conference in June 2019. The rights of individuals to protection from sexual harassment and to work with dignity are also human rights that are universally recognized uh, by various international conventions. However, the labor law in Nigeria is silent about the subject. This has left many people unsure of the available legal options to adopt in seeking redress in Nigeria. Although we have section 34 of the Nigerian constitution, which protects the dignity of individuals at all times, including while in the workplace, ensuring that in the event of a breach of this constitutional right, an aggrieved person can seek remedies in a court of competent jurisdiction. However, the Nigerian laws on workplace harassment and assault is arguably inadequate as there are no explicit provisions to deal with it in the Labor Act of 2010, which only provided for compensation in the event of mental stress caused as a result of sudden uh, an unexpected traumatic event which arises during employment. Furthermore, the criminal law of Lagos State 2011 has provisions criminalizing sexual harassment, making Lagos State the first state in Nigeria to make laws against sexual harassment with section 2621 of the criminal law of Lagos State 2011, which provides that any person who sexually harasses another is guilty of a felony and is liable to imprisonment for three years. Apart from Lagos states, interestingly, no other state in the country have such laws in place. For employers in Nigeria to understand and enjoy the full benefits of their rights at workplaces, it is the duty of every state government and employee, employers to then ensure that sexual harassment doesn't thrive in the work environment by putting mechanisms in place for education, advocacy, and their protection. So the objectives of this uh, learning session is to understand and identify gender-based violence in the workplace, to demystify the power dynamics that enable and exacerbate gender-based violence, and to proffer solutions, both legal and social, to ending the phenomenon in the workplace. We're also hoping that we can then work together, put heads together to identify existing legal and institutional frameworks that protect, that support, and ensure justice for women and girls and punishment for the perpetrator. Joining me to discuss this is Ms. Habiba Balogun, uh, Professor Chioma Agomo, Stephanie Linus Okereke, Dr. Nkiru Balogun, and Dr. Utive Ibuzo, here represented by Mr. Voke Goroje. I welcome you all panelists to uh, this conversation. Our panelists have various um, um, accolades to their name. I'm going to start with Habi Babalogun, who is in, uh, who is, I'm going to start, sorry, with uh, Professor Chioma Agomo, not in any particular order, and she's a Nigerian professor of law at the University of Lagos with specialization in law of contracts, industrial law, insurance law, and gender, and the law. Professor Chioma was appointed a professor of law in 1999 and has served as the head of the Department of Law three times. In 2004, she was elected Dean of the Faculty of Law, making her the first elected female Dean of a faculty in the University of Lagos. She was also made a Honorary Fellow of the Queen Mary University of London in 2011. 
She was the leader of the accreditation team to University of Ghana, Legon, and Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Kumasi, Ghana. Professor Agomo was also the member of the Council of Legal Education, Governing Council, Governing Committee, Nigerian Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. She obtained both her LLB and LLM from the Queen Mary College, University of London, and attended the Nigerian Law School before being called to bar. Good morning and welcome, Professor Chioma Agomo. Good morning. Habiba Balogun is the director and principal consultant of Habiba Balogun Consulting Limited, an organization effectiveness and HR consultancy. She's an executive and leadership coach and a social justice activist with over 28 years experience in strategic human resource management, working nationally and internationally. Since 2017, Habiba has been rolling out context-specific harassment and discrimination policies and training for organizations. She regularly conducts nationwide research and produces resource material on the extent and type of harassment and discrimination in Nigeria's workplaces. Habiba holds a BSc in French and Italian from the University of London and an MSc in organizational management from George Washington University. Washington, D.C. She's also an alumnus of Harvard Business School's Executive Education in Strategic Leadership and Multiple Executive Education Short Courses. Good morning and welcome, Habiba. Good morning. Morning, everyone. Lovely to be here with you. Thank you. I'm also pleased to uh, introduce this woman, Stephanie Linus Okereke, an award-winning actress and activist passionate about women's rights and health. Stephanie is the executive director producer of Drive, a movie that tells a true life story of a 10 year old girl who was a child bride and who died early due to pregnancy related complications, specifically fistula. Through her foundation, Extended Hand, Stephanie has done extensive work in the field of fistula, which earned her the Miriam Makeba Award for Excellence in 2007 and the Beyond the Tears Humanitarian Award. In 2017, Stephanie was named the UNFPA Regional Goodwill Ambassador for West Africa and Central Africa. She holds a BSc in English and Literary Studies from the University of Calabar. Good morning and welcome, Stephanie. It's also my pleasure to introduce Nkiru Balowu. Uh, you don't know her already, she already spoke, but I'll still say, talk about her. She's the Chair African Women on Board an independent non-profit organization amplifying African female voices, activating African female wealth, and changing the material realities of African women and girls worldwide. Nkiru is also the convener of the Africa Soft Power Project, a managing director of RDF Strategies, an, an organizational strategy and stakeholder engagement firm. She has over two decades of professional experience working with clients in various industries, including digital media, technology, telecommunications, financial services, and development institutions. Nkiru holds a doctorate degree from the University of California, Berkeley, a master's from University College London, and a first degree from the University of Manchester. She's been called to the bar in Nigeria, in England, and Wales, and New York State. Good morning, and welcome once again, Nkiru. Thank you. Very nice. Finally, and not the least, I saved uh, our gentleman in, on the panel for last. Dr. Tive Buzo is the Chief of Staff, staff to the Deputy Senate President and Founder, African Center uh, for Leadership Strategy and Development. He's an immediate past international head of campaigns of Action Aid International and Country Director of Action. Action. He was the immediate past international head of uh, campaigns of Action Aid International and country director of Action Aid Nigeria. He is also a honorable commissioner in the Police Service Commission. Prior to joining Action Aid, he was a program coordinator of Center for Democracy and Development, an independent research information and training institution. He's a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Strategic Management. He holds a BSc in pharmacy, MSc in Public Administration and International Relations, and a PhD in Public Administration specializing in policy analysis. Dr. Tive Iguzo, as a government person, has been called to an urgent matter out of town, and he's here represented by Mr. Boke Goroje. Welcome, Mr. Boke, if you're in the room. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be with you. Thank you, Mr. Boke. 
Uh, I will be giving our panelists two minutes each to quickly just give an opening statement. And I would like to start with you, Voke. Just two minutes to tell us what you think about this topic, women, violence, and the workplace. Just two minutes, please. I'll start with you, Mr. Voke, since you're here now. Thank you. Again, thank you for bringing me here. And like you're already aware, that I'm standing for Dr. Tive Guzo. For us at the National Assembly, the issue of violence against women, particularly in the workplace, is something that we believe it is not good for the women and for society, particularly for terms of productivity and, and getting married. The violence against women in the workplace has created a lot of mediocrity and has even discouraged a lot of professionals and uh, women who would naturally give out their best. They have now been relegated to getting favors for sex and other favors. So we believe, particularly in the National Assembly, in the Senate, the Office of the Deputy of the Senate, that we should rise and fight against this cause because it is limiting our women. It is making our women to feel like a product that can be traded in the market and that can be, um, favors can be gotten. And once you cannot get any profit in terms of um, the workplace, then they can be traded out. So we feel it is proper for us to be engaged in this process. It is a continuous process. And we hope that with this learning that women will rise up to the occasion, they will resist um, intimidation in the workplace and they will bring their very A game, bring their capacity, which we know that women have a lot to offer. If you look at the history of countries that have women in governance, over 35%, they are doing very well. So we believe that engaging women in terms of their capacity, in terms of merit, in terms of the ability to deliver will help ensure good governance, promote um, a good entrepreneurial system, and overall increase the social economic capital of Nigeria. Thank so you very much, Mr. Thank Boke. Much. Thank you for keeping to time. Habiba Balogun, please give us your two minute opening statement. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this question of violence in the workplace, it's you know, really distressing. And there's a culture of uh, violence, um, verbal violence, physical violence, threats of violence. There's a culture in our entire society from our homes with domestic workers to the markets, as you stated in your opening statements, and even to the organized workplace. So I focus a lot on the organized workplace because these are the, this is where you'll find the women who are most educated. This is where you'll find women with upward mobility or from middle class and upper, upper, upper class. And if they are not able to you know, um, resist and reduce violence in the workplace, then what are the chances for others? You know, women need to have role models that they can see that, yes, a woman stood up, a woman resisted, a woman pushed back, a woman was able to avoid. Okay, they have to see these role models. So I focus a lot in organizations. And I found out that even as the laws are catching up with the, um, to protect women in the workplace, the culture is stronger. You know, there's that saying that culture eats strategy, right? I found that the workplace culture that, that tolerates it um, is much, much stronger. And I've also found out that the protections that organizations have to give women when they report need also need to be much stronger. So while we are really glad that more and more laws, as you enumerated here, more and more laws are coming into force to protect women in the workplace, women in, uh, in academia, in tertiary educational institutions, um, women in the informal workplace, as well as the formal workplace, there is still a lot of work to do in terms of a culture in our society and a culture in our even in our organized workplaces. I even think the, work, the markets are doing better um, in terms of fighting the culture of you can just touch any woman you want, how you like. I think they are even doing better than organized workplaces. So we have a lot of work to do in order to make sure that women feel safe to report if they cannot address the situation themselves and that the workplace culture will be hostile to anybody who is found carrying out this sort of behavior and that sort of person will be forced to stop or change their behavior. Thank you. Thank you very much, Habiba. Stephanie, you have the floor. Your opening statement, please. 
the good thing is, good morning, everyone. Um, the good thing is that we're talking about it. So the more we talk about it, the more we dis demystify it. So you guys have made a lot of valid points. So I think the more we talk, demystify this thing, get people to understand, get people to be aware, because sometimes people don't know what is readily available for them. So the more we discuss, the more we create more awareness about it, I think that will go a long way in covering this issue and bringing, let it be a topic that people feel comfortable to talk about and nobody is shaming anyone when you come out to see things like that. So I think this is, we're also in the good place where we can have an honest open conversation about it. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Nkiru. Um, so for me, I think I want to spend this time dedicate this little my two minutes to talking about women who have actually led from day one the battle as I would call it um one of my mentors um I mean I actually have two major mentors on this uh, on this panel uh, Miss H I call her Habiba uh, um has been working has been doing this work for for for, for years uh, um Stephanie I know by reputation and I've seen the work she's been doing but I particularly want to talk about Professor Choma Agombo. Uh, um, and that's my two minutes for me. Um, this woman, um, when I moved back to Nigeria, I joined the Faculty of Law at University of Lagos. And she was one of the, in fact, to my mind, to my knowledge, she's probably the only dean of law that has actually reprimanded. In fact, I think two, two of my um, um, colleagues were, were fired under her stewardship because she did not suffer fools. She did not take things, she did not take it lying low. When students complained, investigations were made, you're out. She, there, was no, there was no conversation about it. There was no, oh, who do you know? Let us go and talk to this person. Let us go and whatever it is, let's appeal to the gods. And, oh, you know how it is, this is Nigeria. Oh, this is how it's done, it is how we do it. She did not, she did not tolerate rubbish. And that's what happens when you have more women as leaders. So I think for me, the whole issue of violence in the workplace is really about having women as leaders. When women are leading, when more women are leading, these things are less, you know, they're, 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 they're less. So my two minutes is to say thank you to people who have been doing this work, who have been leading the charge. Stephanie, Habiba, Professor Gomo, I salute you. And of course, to the Ford Foundation team. Thank you, Nkiru. Since you're on, I will just ask you your question right away. So uh, recently, your organization launched its Safety in the Workplace initiative. And thank you for giving that life example. Sometimes when we talk about these issues, it appears to be an out-of-body experience until we can really relate it to what's happening and what has happened to people we know or even to us ourselves. So it's good to hear practical examples of women doing these things, of organizations and institutions who are taking no prisoners and ensuring that uh, workplace violence is stamped out. So I know that African Women on Board recently launched its Safety in the Workplace initiative and that you're currently conducting surveys for stakeholders to, do, uh, to better understand workplace violence against women, uh, especially to help create policy models that you know, can be applied to mitigate the challenge, this challenge across the continent. So can you tell us what was the thinking behind this initiative and but why do you think it's important? Um, I think you already started by saying that it's not an Africa problem, it's a global problem. Most women at some three, one in three, experience some sort of violence in their lifetime. And you know, the whole Me Too movement started and so it seemed like it just became this thing. But we've been at it since, we've been struggling with this thing. I think if you talk to a whole group of men, they'll tell you how they've been running around tables. Oh, this guy is chasing them. I've been chased around tables. I've been grabbed. The police have told me, I have two of you at home. Investors have told me, oh, if you follow me to South Africa, you'll get the money. It just, you know, it gets too much. It just, at some point, you even have, when I was teaching, you even have students coming to, as we say, toast you for grades. So, I mean, that, there was no fear at the time because I was in the position of power, so nothing would happen. But even at that, there was this culture of oh, impunity. And particularly, it's really impressive to have someone from the National Assembly on this, um, in, in this um, in session. Because one of my biggest peeves is that we have sitting senators. We have, what's his name? Abel, Elisha, Elisha Abel, 
who is a senator in Nigeria, who we all saw, we, we saw it live video. He was be, he beat up a woman and he's still in he, at her workplace, perhaps, and he's still there as a senator. So there can't be any change if we don't have change from the top, top bottom. If you think about banks, if you think about big institutions, there's this culture of it's, this is how we do it here. This is our culture. And that's why we said this whole violence against women in the workplace, safety in the workplace. Also, maybe we are orienting the conversation, making it as, oh, this is something that if you don't change your attitude, your workplace will not, your, your company will not do well. So I don't know if that helps in sort of like setting the scene of how it, it, the, the, uh, um, the program started. So you, I, I like that you mentioned, uh, you flagged the culture of impunity. And considering the Me Too movement, uh, movement you also mentioned that uh, in, your, in your speech. Uh, con so considering the Me Too movement we've had in Nigeria recently, you know, what do you think we can do to make it easier for women to come forward? Bearing in mind that even when you come forward, that doesn't make it easier. So, but even taking that first step to come forward, what can we do to make it easier for women to come forward? Especially knowing that, uh, that's just the first step, and things may get better or they may get, get worse, depending on uh, who the perpetrator is. I, I think it has to start from this whole notion of, you know, it's the victim's fault. It's the woman's fault. The woman caused it. What was she wearing? Why was she there? Why did she look at him like that? You know, ah, uh, you know, you even have, you have wives, you know, of uh, um, saying, ah, uh, but what was she doing? Oh, my husband is not like that. Or in any case, even if you were, she must have done something. One of our, one of our um, biggest, um, uh, um, I think one of the women I admire the most is a young woman, Busola Dakolo, who came forward. Well, look at what's happened to her life as she's come forward. She's been haunted, she's been taunted, she's been threatened, you know, all of those things have happened to her. But one of the things that I think was even for me most enduring about the whole thing was her husband supporting her. So we need more men speaking up. It can't just be on women. It's not, the onus is not on us. It is on both men and women. So we need more husbands supporting their wives. We need more men speaking up. If Senator Ab Ab Abo is sitting in that uh, uh, house of, uh, in, in our national assembly, then it just makes the whole place, how can you say that, oh, you're against violence against women and yet this man is there? It's just not, so this culture that we have where it's okay, it's one of the big things that we must, we must actually do. We need men, it can't just be women. A core thing is men. We need institutions, religious institutions have to come up and say, listen, it's not tolerable. We need courts, judges to say, this is not tolerable. I think particularly judges, training for judges in terms of how they even see the, the idea of violence against women and sexual harassment. I have a couple of, I'm a lawyer or I used to be a lawyer. There's a couple of incidents where you have a judge saying, ah, why are you here? Does he beat you? Did he beat you? Like you're not, you have nothing to complain about. So that whole, even from the judiciary and then of course the police. So I think that is a major starting point where we have to say no, but it has to be top down. It can't just be, oh, we're talking to the little people. It has to be an approach where it's top down as well. What applies to the gates man, what applies to the driver, what applies to the common man must apply to the man at the top. And that's one of the ways that I think, including pastors and their wives, and, you know, that it has to be a rule where everybody is sort of like obeying the law, not just the lower class or the so-called people who don't have money or whatever we, we want to call it. Thank you very much for that, Nkira. And just to say uh, to our participants, if you have questions, comments, please, the chat box for uh, Q&A is there kindly. Please pen it down and let's have your questions uh, for the panelists as they speak. Thank you. I'm going to go over to you, Professor Chioma, because you are the legal luminary here. And we've, uh, Kira has mentioned laws, laws, laws. Uh, we know that there are existing laws on sexual harassment and assault in the workplace. Uh, but we want to know what is the current position of the Nigerian labor law on curbing workplace harassment and assault. Professor Chioma Agomo. You are mute, Prof. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. 
There is no specific provision in the Labor Act. You know, we talk of labor law, labor act, the only legislation that deals directly with individual employment relationship is the Labor Act. And that's the 1973 statute, currently under the 2004 laws of the Federation. There is no provision there for sexual harassment or violence. However, the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Third Alteration Act, 2010, that repositioned the National Industrial Court of Nigeria, make specific provision for the court to have exclusive jurisdiction in respect of all matters connected to or relating to discrimination or harassment at the workplace. And the interesting thing about this is that it also gives the National Industrial Court the power to apply international conventions, treaties, and protocols. Some of you may be aware, some may not be aware, that there's a landmark decision following this provision decided by the National Industrial Court under uh, Justice, Honorable Justice Osage, where that's the case called AJK Madoka and Microsoft. Well celebrated case, the landmark case, the first case on sexual harassment in Nigeria, where the judge used Section 34 of the Constitution, which you have mentioned, saying that harassment is an affront to human dignity. She also used CEDO. Convention Against all Discrimination, All Discrimination Against Women, and the protocol. In other words, she called in aid many of the national instruments on sexual harassment and all that, and found for the claimant against Microsoft Nigeria. So when we talk of law, no, there is no direct law, but yes, there's provision, and it's been used, apart from AJK Maduka, there have been other decisions, one or two other decisions on sexual harassment based on this because the constitution now specifically makes provision for sexual harassment at the workplace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Chioma. I will then go to Habiba, especially because of the uh, a labor act that uh, Professor Agomo has, uh, has highlighted. And you have done extensive research in this area, Habiba. Um, so at, at, at the way we have these laws, uh, policies of uh, practices and workplace cultures, even though Professor Agomo has mentioned that we don't have any specificity to it. What we, are, what we have existing, you know, are these sufficient to address uh, the menace of sexual harassment, assault, and other forms of GBV in the workplace? based on your research, of course, happy Um, So I think uh, there's a lot more awareness has to be done, okay? I think we've got sufficient examples of laws, okay? Some of them, um, that, and you know, all these laws to really impact our people's lives, they have to be domesticated at the state level. So the best example is the criminal uh, law of Lagos State that gives you a three year sentence. Yes, if you are found guilty of sexual harassment and they spell out exactly what it means, whether it's verbal, whether it's physical, whether it's non-verbal, whether it goes into um, assault, right? Which of course is already covered under existing laws. So I think that's a good example. And then of course the act, the, the recent act that was passed uh, this year um, against sexual harassment in tertiary institutions, that, that one gives a five-year sentence. So we've got examples, but I think in terms of the workplace, and this really works mostly for the organized workplace, um, because you need to have a lawyer to file your case in the National Industrial Court. That's the best protection. The thing is, but what it will give you, I don't think the National Industrial Court will, send, will jail anybody, but it will make sure that you are compensated for your distress, compensated for losing your job and stuff like that. But I think even that is, it would be a major deterrent if enough people knew about it. 
And if enough people knew about the free uh, legal services that are available, whether it's Legal Aid Council of Nigeria, whether it's a Project Alert, whether it's Word C, there are lots of organizations now that will provide you with assistance. So there's not enough awareness uh, amongst the women that you know there's legal aid available for you. You can take a case, and your boss, might, your employer might have to reinstate you, or compensate you for your finance, compensate you adequately for your financial loss. So the in the Microsoft case that uh, Professor Agomo mentioned, the complaint I think she ended up getting thirteen million naira as her award. I believe so. Um, so the awards can be significant. It can be significant. So there are examples of cases of laws, but I don't think they're sufficient. And when you look at whether the laws are enough, the laws are not enough. I actually did some research on the on even if you know. So I've got educated people who know that they are protected by company policy. Okay, so sometimes even when the law is not there, if company policy states that we have a policy zero tolerance, it's against our organizational, if you are caught, if you are found guilty, you'll be sacked. So even when it's against company policy, okay, and they are aware, why don't they report? We found out 88% of people who will admit to being sexually harassed will not report. 88%. So we now delved in to find out why won't you report? And it is because if they report, well, number one, they don't want to make the man lose his job. They're not interested in forcing a man to lose his job. Okay, most of the time, the perpetrators are male. Let's just say, from my research, about 95, 94 to 95% of the perpetrators are male. Okay, so they don't want the man to lose his job. They just want him to stop harassing or touching or making their life miserable. So that's the first thing. And if they report, the, the most likely, where there's zero tolerance, the man will lose his job. So for that reason, they don't report. And then for where they are not bothered about the man losing his job because he's made their life so miserable. Okay there is the, the situation becomes worse for them even if the man is transferred or sanctioned or suspended or sacked their own personal employment conditions become worse so law as i said there are laws examples of laws that need to be domesticated in states there are examples of good company policy in organizations but that alone is not enough um, one, the people who have to be empowered to take advantage of the laws, so things like the gender desk at the police stations, more awareness about legal aid council, public defender's office, and stuff like that. And then protection from retaliation. Protection from retaliation. That's also called victimization, right? But you don't want to be victimized. You want to be protected from victimization in the first place. A lot more work needs to go in that's my opinion. Thank you, Habiba. I want to move now to um, Mr. Voke because you're in parliament, uh, at least you, are, you work in the National Assembly. So I'll ask you this question, which flows from uh, the laws we've been talking about. Now, due to the duality of the Nigerian statutes, we have uh, the Nigerian constitution, we also have the customary, and you know, all these other statutes uh, flowing around the place. There are so many loopholes and there's an absence of women focused considerations. Can we then argue that the laws in Nigeria are not wired to curb discrimination against women and effectively shield women from acts uh, of violence? You know, different governments around the world continue, re uh, you know, reform to, to continue to reform laws to create better conditions for women. But I'm curious to know, and I'm sure all our participants are also, Mr. Voke, what active measures is the Nigerian legislature taking to do the same in Nigeria? Thank you very much for your question. Um, first, I, I must say that I should be intimidated as the only male on this panel on a lighter note. <laughs> welcome welcome but to our world. to your question, <laughs> I, I think, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, I think, I think uh, the National Assembly is very committed to strengthening the laws in Nigeria, uh, particularly as their mandate is, which is for of making laws for the good governance of Nigeria. So the National Assembly, particularly the Ninth National Assembly, is very committed to making laws that will help to promote women 
both in parliament, in governance generally, and strengthening women in the workplace. If you look at the, um, the uh, when the National Assembly came into, came, came into this session, the bill, which is very popular bill, the bill for an act to prevent, prohibit, and uh, redress sexual harassment, particularly for students in tertiary institutions, was very popular. And again, the National Assembly went further to create another bill that will, that will involve protection of the women generally in the workplace, which was sponsored by a female legislator. I, I think by and large, the National Assembly is committed to uh, promoting the, the place of women and stop, stopping the violence against women in the workplace. And again, because they believe, and I speak as uh, a, 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 an aide to the a distinguished uh, senator of your mark again, they believe Please. that except they take violence in workplaces, Hello? I think we're losing you, Mr. Avoke. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can now. Okay. Uh, like I said, I said the National Assembly is committed to strengthening the participation of women in politics and helping to curb uh, sexual and gender-based violence, particularly in the workplace. And the laws that they have, uh, they have promoted so far, and which is in line with international practice, because today, Parliament and executive uh, sessions are working to strengthen women's participation by bringing the useful laws. So I think I can say categorically that the National Assembly has uh, taken a right step in strengthening women's rights. And also, don't forget that the National Assembly cannot work alone in this. It must work with the state houses of assembly, such that laws that are passed some of the laws that are passed in the National Assembly have to be domesticated, as uh, Ms. Habiba said, have to be domesticated in the state. For example, the VAP Act. Today, we have about 16 states that have domesticated the VAP Act. And there is considered effort by um, members of the Governor's, Governor's Wives Forum to, to ensure that all the states in the Federation domesticate the VAP Act. That is a clear example of how the National Assembly is working to promote laws that will strengthen that will curb discrimination against women and that will curb violence against women, particularly in workplace. Also, the National Assembly can also domesticate uh, international practices like the ILO Convention based on Section 12, Subsection 3 of the 1999 Constitution as amended to domesticate international treaties, conventions that again seek to promote and help to combat discrimination against women and violence against women in workplace. So by and large, I can say that the National National Assembly is committed to doing that, is committed to strengthening women's rights by bringing good laws, laws that will favor women, that will curb discrimination against uh, women in workplace, particularly sexual violence and sexual harassment. Thank you very much, Mr. Voke, for that. But I'll ask you a very sensitive one right now. Habiba mentioned uh, a serving uh, a National Assembly member. I know that you are not a serving legislator. Uh, but what is the general um, what is the general consensus uh, you know around the National Assembly regarding what has happened with a, the the Senator Abu, and we also have a case in Kogi State, and I was at a, a launch of the Nigerian Governor's Wives Against Gender Based Violence yesterday at the Hilton, where the Governor of Kogi State himself was also called out for harboring a commissioner who, had, who was alleged to have assaulted a woman. And he said, he, in his defense, he said that he cannot take any position because the case was in court and that the commissioner cannot be um, sacked or interdicted or anything until that case, uh, you know, has, has been heard by a, competent, a, a court of competent jurisdiction. But people were like, why well, at least something should be done in the interim to show that you don't condone such behavior, even if it's, it's a suspension or an interdiction. And if the person is found to be innocent, he can then be reinstated. But the onus and is always on the victim. It's always the victim that suffers. Uh, the perpetrator always goes scot free, continues his or her life, you know, as if nothing has happened. What can we do to change that kind of position where there's some deterrent and we can say, we hear you, 
but we need to be sure that this is true and you, you shouldn't be made to suffer alone. Thank you. I, I think like you, you rightly alluded to, I, I'm not a member, I'm not elected member, so I may not be able to speak specifically as per the, the position of the Senate on that. But what I can say is this, if you look at the bill that was passed, that was passed by the Senate on sexual harassment, it was sponsored by Senator Vio Mwangi, like I said, it was co-sponsored by 106 senators. There are 109 senators in the national in the senate so it was co-sponsored by 106 senators that would tell you the mood of the senate in terms of stopping harassment i wish we knew the three who didn't harassment. sponsor it <laughs> i wish we knew the three well, who didn't it. Uh, honestly i can make available a copy of the bill for you at the end of this session and you will Thank see you. the bill Okay, you will see the name of the co-sponsors and then you can do your findings and who didn't sponsor. Uh, I, I think uh, that's the best I can do as regards that. But going further, and you can also see the way the House of Reps has also taken up the issue of uh, gender-based violence. You know, so I, I think I can say in the National Assembly here, there is a, there is a, there is a mood for them to support uh, combating violence against women in workplaces. Because come to think of it, even, if, even for those male senators, they have wives, they have sisters, they have daughters, they have mothers. So who would want this to happen to one of their own? I don't think it's in anybody's interest not to support any male interest, not to support Copying violence against women. Because if you think that today you, you are a perpetrator, you are a male, you don't know where your sister will go to, you don't know where your wife will go to, you don't know where your, your mother will go to. So I, I think it's in the interest, and that is the mood I see talking to a members of the National Assembly here, and where they have welcomed the, particularly if you look at distinguishing it of your Mwagige, almost every women group. I've paid him visit, and most times when it comes to women group, he personally receives them. He Hello? Hello? Okay, I think we, we have lost Mr. Victor. I want to go to you, Professor Chioma Agomo. Um, to speak uh, on the laws issue, as you mentioned in your chat. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, I want to say that it's uh, okay to have the laws. That's uh, the legal state's law that prescribes criminal sanctions. And earlier, the most important thing is the issue of awareness. Now, coming back to the issue of the National, that's the National Industrial Court and Section 254C1 and 2 of the uh, Third Alteration Act that makes it uh, the province of the National Industrial Court to deal with sexual harassment issues, you will find that if the public understands the full import of that provision, there is no need for issue of domestication we keep talking about, section 12, because it says notwithstanding anything to the contrary, any other law, which means that the National Industrial Court has the power to apply not only international conventions and uh, treaties and protocols, but also international best practices. And the National Industrial Court has also gone ahead to pro uh, produce in its um, uh, order, the rules of courts, I think it's 2017. And it makes specific provisions on sexual harassment, the various aspects of uh, sexual harassment, how you will come about it. And the position of the National Industrial Court now, the two levels, if a convention has already been ratified by Nigeria, all you have to do is to mention it and then it will be applied. But if it's not been ratified, then it's a matter for evidence, which means that counsel we have to prove it. Yes, Habibat made a very valid point. It's the issue of accessibility, having access to the court and uh, uh, 
Uh, she also mentioned the NGOs and all the other organizations that are on ground that, that can help. Even the Lagos State has its own uh, outfits that can help people who feel they are not able to. So the critical point is awareness, having the awareness to know that it's not as hopeless or as helpless as we would think, but it, can, it, it takes the, uh, you need to take it to that level of the willingness. It's one thing to have the law, but it's another thing to have the will to bring it to pass. If Obaseki or Sage had not interpreted the law the way she did, we would still be where we were before because she said, oh, she enjoyed counsel making his presentation, but when he came to the remedy that he, he said, he felt like his hands were tied. And he said, if your hands were tied, mine are not tied. So I'm going to go ahead and apply this. So we need to have that activism, that creativity, and that's how to have that much, awareness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. We have a question from Ami Oyekunle, and she's asking, can we talk about the need for workplace to have sexual harassment policies? Is this compulsory? How many organizations have and implement these policies? I'd like Habiba to take a shot at this question, please. Can we talk about the need for workplace, uh, workplaces to have sexual harassment policies? Is this compulsory? And how many organizations have and implement these policies? Habiba Balogo, do you want to respond to that, please? Thank you. Yes, yes I can. Hi, Amy. Um, I know Amy's done a lot of work in, with women as women empowerment as well. Um, so let's not talk about MSMEs. And I hope you know that 85% of employers in Nigeria are micro, small, and medium employers. Mm -hmm. They don't even have HR policy. They don't have any policy. So <laughs> let's leave that one aside, right? So the majority of our employers don't have policy. Um, and think about it, it we, uh, many of us employ in our homes too. So there's a huge army of domestic workers. And of course, there are no policies that their employers are using for them. But if we go to the organized sector, the organized sector, about 70% of those organizations have sexual harassment policies. Their own challenge is the same challenge with all the laws that we have in Nigeria. It is enforcement. So what is it? What is the situation? Number one, until recently, Sexual harassment is not taken seriously. When we do a survey about consent, so the consent is consenting to sex, okay? You find out that men don't understand as far as they're concerned, if the woman doesn't say, scream, no, and is not kicking and shouting and crying, any, any other response is agreement, is a green light, okay? So they don't even feel that they're harassing you in the first place. When they, you make it clear that there's harassment, you even report it. Many organizations feel that they have to make a choice between a man who is doing a good job technically and is making money for the organization and a woman who in many cases in, in organized workplaces is in a support function and is junior. So you're talking about a senior man in a core function who is income generating and a junior woman who is in a support function that is a cost center, okay? So very many businesses look at it from that standpoint. It's only recently that they're seeing the data that shows that when you have a culture where there is harassment, you are losing so much money. You're losing productivity, staff morale is low, there's lack of creativity. So as a business, you cannot grow when you allow that sort of behaviors. So initially they look at it as a choice between two people, I have to forgive this man, okay? So they have the policies. So in the big, in the, I have some multinational clients, so they have the policies, they will enforce the policies. They will even enforce the policies, but the people will not report. Why? Because I had a case of a lady who reported and the man was sacked and she was in it. She was a technical, she was a technical lady. And when it was time for her to get another job, the word had gone around in the industry that, oh, that is that woman who caused so-and-so man to be sacked. She might be a troublemaker. So she's good though, but, okay, so, we have to really tackle the culture because until we tackle the culture of this is not acceptable, it is even harming our bottom line. We are making less profit, okay? And we must protect any employee, no matter how senior, no matter how junior, whether it's a, a service provider employee or a full-time staff, we really have to change that. So 70% so of employers in the organized sector have policies against sexual harassment. 
Thank you, Habiba. She also has a follow-on question that she says, she's asking, is there a possibility of institutions being named and shamed where such policies are clearly lacking? I want you to take a stab at that. And then I'll go to Stephanie to also say something about that because I also want to ask her about the entertainment industry, which is threatening. Welcome back, Voke. You have a question and I will still come back to you. So is there a possibility of institutions to name and shame where such policies are lacking? First, Habiba, then I'll go to Stephanie. Okay, so I'll make it short. I don't think there's any need for naming and shaming. The Convention on Business Integrity and there are other organizations are putting to work to a good governance ranking. So part of good governance ranking is that you must have policies like this to protect your staff. And if you, are, if you have good governance ranking, you get preferential tax breaks, you get all kinds of things. So I think that's the way to go. Let it cost them in their pocket more than anything else. But you know, if you find out that a big organization doesn't have the policy, definitely put the word out. Before you know it, that policy will be put in place. Thank you. I like the habit, but let it cost them in their, in their pockets. And if there's any language organized institutions understand, it is money. It is the balance sheet. Um, Stephanie, hmm, I'm sure you know what I'm going to ask you. Huh? <laughs> so we know uh, uh, in the, we can argue, you know, that the Nigerian entertainment industry panders to the male gaze. That's a loan from, from movies in Hollywood, from I wish we had somebody in the music industry here. And these sort of objectifies women and reinforcing very harmful, sexist uh, stereotypes. The entertainment industry has sort of become an institution that normalizes this problem rather than challenge it. However, in, in, in a country where creatives need to balance the need for profit against whatever personal ideas they have, how can we create an industry uh, that produces socially responsible arts? Stephanie. Thank you so much. Well, I won't generalize that every content that is coming out from the entertainment industry caters for the movies. I think there are also different stories. But I think that links to the fact of women. Well, like for me, for instance, I felt as an actress, I really sometimes do not have control, majority control of what the story will be. But if I go behind the scene and I get to develop the story, get to produce it, get to direct it, I have like full control of what the story, the kind of story that I want to do. And I think that's one of the, the direction that I took in my career by going behind the scene and saying, you guys, because if you wait for them to bring you the script and you bring, you read, you can only complain, but you can go behind and say, okay, these are the stories that I want to say. These are the women. If I'm in this situation, this is what I want to project because sometimes um, art is there for you to, you can say what the situation is, but you can also prefer different kinds of solution. So sometimes you see what a woman goes through and then at the end, the resolution, I know it happens to majority of the people, but it's also it, for me, I'm like, if I'm in that situation, can't I give the women other options than just giving them this particular kind of outcomes? Because there are different ways that the outcome can go. So the majority in the way to actually come is for us to take control of our story, how we project it. And I'm happy that a lot of filmmakers, you know, you, after shooting Drive, for instance, a lot of people started thinking about socially conscious movie, how you can to take to a socially conscious movie or just a, any story entirely, but tell it in a very interesting um, and also futuristic way of what you want people or how you want people to behave. So I think a lot more work has to be done in our industry. And I think we are also working because a lot of women are producing now. A lot of women are going behind the scenes um, because sometimes majority was just mere people telling our story. So a man, you've been with a man in the house, how many years? You have all these children and then the man will chase you out of the house. And you're like shouting in your house. Oh, I don't know where to go, but we should also provide solution, even though it's not seemingly in our laws. But what, like Professor is saying, that, that knowledge is power. So there's a lot of our, uh, uh, there's a lot of um, awareness. Sorry, there's a lot of awareness creation that needs to be done for people to understand what is available for them. And through us as entertainers, is for also also help project things that are available for them, so that when they find themselves in those situations, they will know how to apply themselves. Stephanie, so I'll go on to asking the role that culture 
uh, plays in managing and addressing violence against women in the workplace. I'm happy you mentioned uh, your movie, Dry, which is fantastic, by the way. If you haven't watched it and you're here, please do. And, you know, but I want to see the movies that come out every time. They just seem to reinforce certain stereotypes, placing women in precarious situations. And, you know, as, as a, we, are, we, are, we are a product of socialization. Whatever we see, whatever we hear, you know, we sort of imbibe it and we normalize it. Mm -hmm. So how are you in the, mu in the entertainment industry? I don't want to go to the music industry because that's not your forte. And I know people will ask about comedians and I'm going to talk about the EU advert that recently came out uh, with people denouncing rape and the calls that some of the uh, personalities in this, um, in this skit are themselves people who joke about rape. What is Nollywood or the entertainment industry in Nigeria as a whole doing? How are we helping to change uh, this culture of silence, to curb this culture of silence, which kind of breeds uh, permissiveness? How can we break that? How can we manage and address that with the kind of uh, arts that we bring up? Well, the culture of silence is first of all demystifying everything. This is demystifying the stereotype, demystifying the fact that women feel uncomfortable to tell their stories. So we first of all have to demystify the fights, keep speaking about this thing constantly so that we break whatever hold that it holds on the individual. So if people, all of us are talking about sexual, oh, it happened to you, it happened to you, people are more comfortable to share those stories. And then people start sharing the solutions start sharing information on what is available to you. I think that will give people more courage to come up and stand against it. And, you know, Habib, you talked about shaming, not shaming the company. I think shaming because sometimes the laws are slow. So shaming, because everybody likes their reputation, shaming is also very important to actually call out people and actually let people understand that the power they have, especially their buying power. So if you have a company, you have the people or products that is perpetrating these things, you can tell them, you know, for instance, stop patronizing these people. Let's stop patronizing them if you're not, you know, recognizing or putting women in an uncomfortable position. For us as filmmakers, we have to draw, like take out all this, um, research that you've done, both the laws, what is available, and have a way to create awareness. Awareness is so important. Like that's how we break the culture by getting people to speak up and making creating the enabling environment, a comfortable environment for people to talk, and then showing them it is possible. It is possible. It is possible. It is possible. What I'm saying that is like. I still go back with dry because when you show people, they get to understand it more because all the nuances, you know, with sexual harassment, there's certain nuances that people don't understand that they don't even feel that I'm doing anything wrong. But as a way you can visually present the situation to people, they not get, they're not, oh, okay, so this is it. They not get to understand you have to be more cultural, you have to be more respectful when you address people. So people are more cultural. When you also shame, and then they see a lot of people have shamed it. Everybody start adjusting themselves automatically. But awareness creation is so key to get people to break down the information. Because what, what happens is that we have so much laws. Government is doing their own one side. NGO is doing um, one side. There's no communication. People don't understand what is going on. So if we're able to break down these laws, break it down to even if you're a five-year-old, you should understand what is available, what is available for you. That if someone does this to you, tell them it's not acceptable. Say it to your mom, say it to people, you know, just make it comfortable for people to speak about it. And we, breaking this information, creating the awareness so that it gets into our heads. I think that will break everything. Just like you talked about the comedian. So now you, you've been called on to do something against rape. So when you're doing the next comedy, I'm sure your brain will sort of like reset because people really don't know. And there's certain things you just don't want to touch because you don't touch it. There's certain things you have to be creative in the way you approach this. As like you're, you're saying it as a joke, but to defer, to say, okay, this happened, but you're, this is not, you know, you have to use your skits creatively. So it's good that those things, those backlashes are coming. So you go back and restructure your comedy. You go back and restructure yourself. So there has to be checks and balances in our society. Awareness creation, no matter what we do, if people, knowledge is power. If people are not aware, if people don't know the power that lies within them, they'll keep falling victim. And as a woman, we have so much power and we have to also support other women as well. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, we have Professor Moju Baolu Okome, and she writes, it's true that knowledge is power, so there is need for serious long-term public education and funding of initiatives that enable victims, stroke survivors of workplace violence to access the protection that laws potentially provide. These are inadequate so far. 
also, in my opinion, social tolerance for perpetrators' comfort is way too high. I completely agree with that. There's insufficient acknowledgement of the harm done to victims and survivors. There's also a culture of either tacit or even blatant social silence and prevalence of silencing whistleblowers and victims. Many families discourage whistleblowing. Religious institutions mostly support perpetrators. Public opinion equally does the same. Without changing these things, nothing will change in an appreciable manner. Thank you very much for penning that, Professor Mojubaolo Kome. Omo Umi Ashubiaro Dada writes, and she's asking uh, Mr. Voki, I'm sorry, even though you're not in the National Assembly <laughs> as a legislator, you keep getting questions. She says, please, can we know what the Senate is doing on Elisha Abo? If the court has now made him to pay compensation, what powers does the Senate have over him? Or would we have to rely on his constituency recalling him because they gave him the power to represent them? Please do whatever you can to respond to this. <laughs> okay. I would I would try to respond honestly, and you know that I'm seriously handicapped in this. And uh, first of all, you know when this thing happened, uh, the Senate set up a an investigative panel which was chaired by distinguished Senator Oluremi Tinubu, and most of us saw watch some of their proceedings live and then there was a court case i think now that the court have spoken the senate must respect the uh, the, the procedure of the court uh honestly i cannot go further into what the senate will do or what the senate will not do i know that the court has given judgment and, and I think the judgment of the court supersede every other action. Uh, the Senate may take action, but honestly, I do not think so at this stage, now that the court has made pronouncement. Again, it brings the, the constituents of the senator to act. We can't channel some of these efforts to uh, creating some kind of movement around the, 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 the constituent of the senator. So I, I, I think, unfortunately, I, I really know that a lot of people want to hear more than what I have said, but honestly, I cannot say more than this because over oh, here yeah, I do not Thank have you, Mr. The, the fact. I, I, we apologize for putting you on the spot, but really, exactly. the Thank conversations you. that we need to have, the, the, yes. the National oh, Assembly... No, no, no. But I, think, but I think this must be said. Yes. The Senate did not condole it, and we all know this. There was a panel that was set up. And of course, some of us saw the videos of the sittings of the committee. So that's 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 a clear indication that they didn't condole it. Then they went to court, and of course, once it, the matter is in court, the Senate must respect the proceedings and thank God the court has given judgment and it's now for us to comply with the judgment of the court in this in this in this case. Thank you very much. Mufulia Fijabi, uh, CEO of the Nigerian Women Trust Fund, uh, writes and I, I think she also has a this question. Uh, she said, good morning. I would like to commend all the speakers and also add that workplaces need, need should be classified as formal and informal workplaces. So far, so much attention has been paid uh, to the formal or organized sector and less on the informal sector or organized, which affects women more, especially in the rural areas. How do we advance this course around workplace sexual harassment deeply involving the organized sector, unorganized sector? I would, I would ask uh, Habiba to answer the, this question and if Nkiru can also chip in, especially because Habiba already did mention that unfortunately, 95% uh, or was it 85% of our workplaces are informal and these people don't even have HR policies, let alone having uh, sexual assault policies. Thank you, Habiba. Yeah, thanks. I was just typing an answer in the chat to Mufulia. Thank you very much for that question. Um, yes, so that is where the, the epidemic is happening. You know, during COVID, they said there was an epidemic on sexual and gender-based violence. That epidemic was happening in the informal sector. That is where the real epidemic is. Um, oh, yes, not, not just rape, all kinds. You know, sexual violence comes in all, it comes in, 
you know, when somebody speaks to you a certain way, you can go away shaking. You'll be visibly shaking. You might need medication. Okay. So there's verbal, there's non-verbal before you even get to touch. Okay. Before you get to assault, before you get to force the sexual acts, before you get to rape, before you get to defilement. Okay. So the sexual violence takes many, many forms. Um, and, the, and of course, just battery, that's your agenda based battery, you know, just battery. So in the informal sector, we need to do a lot of work. I know there are a lot of CSOs doing a lot, but it's all fragmented. And this is the role of, for me, this is the role of policymaking and laws. Because if the policymaking is done in a correct way, state government, local governments will mobilize, okay? They will bring together the parties who are at, in their local communities, the women's groups, the youth groups, even the men's groups, the religious groups. I mean, I don't want to, uh, to paint all religious, all religions and religious leaders as supporting this. No, because just last week, I heard a reverend and I had a, a, a leader of one of the associations of imams come out and say that from their own reading of their holy books, there's nothing there that says uh, it is acceptable to be violent toward women. So they came out to say that as well. So I think a lot more coordination needs to happen at the local government level, world level, local government level. There are a lot of organizations doing a lot of work, but they're not in, in the environment in terms of policy, especially at state level is not there helping them. The other thing is that in terms of awareness and outreach, this is where you need those huge campaigns. This is where Nollywood, this is where the music industry, this is where the radio can really help. But I hope all of you saw a video, a film that was out on Al Jazeera. I think it was out like 10 days ago. It was called Mrs. F, Nigerian Women Work on Water. And it was documenting the work of Ifoma Fafuma with Hear Word, how she carried her play into Makoko, which for those of you who don't know, it is a slum in Lagos. Uh, on water, uh, houses on stilts, and she found out what are the gender-based violence issues in that community, made, dramatized them, got some of the local women, taught them how to become actresses, right? And they uh, got the religious, religious, religious leaders, traditional rulers on board, and they put on the play for their entire community. And there was immediate impact, immediate. Some of the young boys who used to harass the girls, I raped the girl, immediately stopped, immediately stopped. So the, so we need more of those sort of initiatives. We know that drama works in Nigeria, in our communities, we know, but it costs a lot of money to take a troop from one village to, uh, to another village. So funding, funding is a major issue. We need some people who are ready to fund this sort of awareness. So I hope that thank answers you, Habiba. It. Yeah, thank you, Habiba. Actually, I'll come to you, uh, Mr. Voke. Nkiru, I wanted to follow up so that we don't lose this trend. Uh, because someone, Anuli Olani, uh, CEO of HAIR, asked a question. She says, good morning. Workplaces are relative, bar, restaurants, schools, or Fortune 500 companies. Today, a chat, chat room was agog by the recent article made by uh, Dr. Sam Ahmadi's allegations on what some politicians do with young girls. He too was called out by some women in that group and a notable organization's boss as well. So we're all being held accountable thanks to social media. Then she asks, I want to please ask how many women in positions of authority or even work colleagues in such workplaces can play a positive role in, in, uh, in that organization's to help combat, protect, and put, prosecute acts of violence. Uh, thank you. And Kira, I think you get the meat of what she, she just wants to know. I mean, like African women on board, your research, your work, working with women in, in, in leadership positions, how do we use, how do you use your authority, your position? How does that translate to, to playing a positive role? Thanks, um, Funke. I, I think that's a really important question. But I also wanted to use the opportunity to talk about the fact that women and senior women uh, um, also are, are, are subject to this problem. I know a number of senior women. I've been a senior woman myself and I, it wasn't my seniority because really it's about power. Who controls the power, economic power? It's about, you know, your investors are men. The people, the senator, the senate is full of men. So even senior women, I have 
CEOs on the podcast that we're starting tomorrow. We have a couple of CEOs who have themselves experienced violence. And you experience violence from not just, you know, senior men, but it's also colleagues. It's, it's, it can be police. There's a whole, co I think, and that's why it's really important for us to go back to the things that we can actually do, which is a culture shift. It was really interesting when Ms. H. Habiba was talking about the role of Nollywood and Stephanie talked about it. And you know, um, my, my thesis, um, my doctoral thesis was actually on um, Nollywood and its role in society and its depiction of women. Think about Nollywood movies of before. Think about living in bondage. Think about all of those movies. Women were, you know, um, snakes. They were uh, Jezebel's husband snatchers. Their uh, mother-in-law was always trying to kill somebody. You know, and men were the ones making these films. So we need more women. If you think about it, films, culture can, films can change things faster than laws. You know, women, all of, you're talking about, you know, the 97% the, um, of Nigerians are, you know, living on, you know, very little money. And Africans really, what do they watch? What do they engage? They engage media, they engage radio, they engage television, they engage, that's where they get the information from. So rather than concentrate, which is what my, I, even though I'm a lawyer, I was writing about film because I feel like that's one quick way of winning. So if international organizations, organizations like Ford Foundation, organizations like, you know, I think funding the creative sector is actually crucial to actual uh, real change because real change laws, even judges, they watch these movies. When you see women constantly being victims in movies, when you see yourself every time they're beating you, every time your husband slaps you, every time, you know, you, even women are also, by the way, let's just make a point. This is not just about sexual violence. Women are themselves perpetrators of violence. It's women that are beating their house girls. It is women who are beating their house girls. At, it's not the men. It is the women. It is women as, who are saying, what did you do? Why did you go there? You know what I mean? So it's not just men. It is a culture shift. We must do better. We must do differently. And I think movies and, as you said, film, movies and music can be a strong way of getting this done. Thank you very much. Hopefully that's useful. Thank yeah. you, Kiru. I will go to Vokia. Mr. Vokia wanted to say something, but we have a young woman in, in, in the audience. Her name is Lois Auta. Uh, she's a young woman living with disability, and I just wanted to give her two minutes to also speak about how violence in the workplace affects women and girls living with disability differently. Uh, so, uh, Lois, if you are in the, in the room, uh, please raise your hand so that we can unmute you to do that while I, I give the floor to Mr. Boke Koroje, who wanted to make a point. Thank you, uh, Funke. I just wanted to, to quickly flow with Habiba when she talked about the issue of uh, different groups working, uh, working like in silos. Uh, and I think it's, 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 it's really, really important that we really need to synergize and, and put all our efforts together so that we can have a, a, an overall objective that we seek to achieve. For example, now, if, if, if you want to see change happen, and four things for me are, are key in terms of making this. We need law. We need the right kind of laws that will help to set the scene. Then we need policy. We need the policy that will activate what the laws have put in place. Then we need practice. Then we need behavior. Now we put this, this, this four together, then sure we can make a change. So if we are able to have different groups doing different things and we synergize this together, we can have an overall uh, uh, goal. Now I said something when I, when I was being asked about Senator uh, um, Abu, the place of the constituents. Now, if civil society channel a lot of energy to those constituents and those constituents are able to make demands, I think it will even be more effective than whatever sanctions that the Senate committee will give because these politicians are so scared of their constituents and whatever reaction they get from their constituent determines to a large extent what they do with themselves. So I, I think the place of synergy is important. And I think, uh, again, like Inkiru said, creating more funding, more funding for this kind of initiative will help to, 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 move, to move us closer 
to where we want to be. That just wanted, I wanted to flow from what Abiba was saying. That Thank was you, right. Mr. Voke, for doing that. But really, uh, our work as civil society, private foundations, and international development partners is to support. And we're always here uh, to support uh, the process of changing uh, um, society, you know, is huge. Government may not really put money in those things. Government usually puts money in infrastructure, uh, you know, in projects and all. And of course, makes the policies and laws that foundations and civil society can then use to do the kind of, uh, you know, societal reconstruction that we, we can do. But also the onus is on government, really, to set the ball rolling to make the environment as conducive as possible. Cynthia is here. Cynthia Mbamalu says, good afternoon and thank you to all the panelists uh, for the insightful contributions. My question rides on the question by Mufuliat. How do we ensure that more civil society organizations mainstream a sexual harassment policy that protects staff and beneficiaries engaging in the sector? In addition, how do we provide accountability mechanisms within the civil society uh, space, business, private sector, entertainment, and public sector that ensures that sexual abusers who occupy important positions are held accountable for their actions. Cynthia, I actually want you to answer that because you are, I had called you earlier. Uh, if you are in the room, can you let us know? We can unmute you so that you can talk about how civil society organizations, you know, can mainstream sexual harassment policy that protects uh, staff and even beneficiaries engaging in the sector. If you're in the room, please let us know. And then I want to give the floor to Lois Alta, who is a young woman uh, living with disability. I want her to tell us her experience and what uh, we uh, should be doing in this sector. Because for young women living this, uh, in, in the sector, it's, it's, double, it's, it's more like a double jeopardy for them. Lois, the floor is yours. No, no. Please, am I audible? Yes, you are, Lois. Yeah. We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, women and girls with disabilities faces a lot of challenges and difficulties in their day-to-day -day lives. And I would like to talk about on employment opportunities. Some of us at our workplaces find it difficult to perform maximally because of perception of our bosses and supervisors. They feel we cannot do the job. They feel we are incompetent and they don't even give us the opportunity to work and we are employed. I would like to share a personal experience when I was a support staff with NNPC before I joined politics, I had to resign. I had issue with my supervisor. I reported him to the next level of our bosses because he refused giving me duties and responsibilities. And this is a woman that is managing two global NGOs, Cedar Seed Foundation and Network of Disabled Women. I am doing well in the NGO sector, but in the other part, they see disability first before the competencies. So this is something we need to address as quickly as possible. And when it comes to gender-based violence, women and girls with disabilities are much more prone and vulnerable to this because of our forms of disabilities. When a deaf woman is raped, how can she share her story? And when a woman in a wheelchair like me is attacked, how can I defend myself? How can I run? And when a, a blind woman is attacked, how can she describe who raped her? 
can we come up with solutions like an app on our wrist that we can touch and raise alarm that, yes, I'm under an attack and rescue should, should, should be provided as quickly as possible. Let me stop here for now. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Lois. Uh, you have actually brought a different uh, perspective to this conversation. And I'm sober. I Sometimes we don't think about these things that way because it doesn't, uh, it's not a situation and it's not a reality. I'm glad that you had a chance to speak and I, I hope you can stay on longer in case there are questions that we need to take. I only want to ask, what then do you think? Are there, are there concrete uh, steps you think uh, we should take. Habiba is writing here that people living with disabilities are usually targeted by predators and global research shows a higher proportion of them being sexually assaulted, sexually assaulted and victimized if they complain. Uh, we thank you so much for sharing this, Lois, and we'll be relying on you in terms of what can we do? What then are the kind of problem strategies that we can employ uh, to help uh, reduce the burden? Because Curbing violence against women and girls is a process. It's not a, a bullet that, that would just fire and everything will be all right. But it's a process and on this journey, we need all hands on deck. Lois, do you want to share more? Yes, I mentioned earlier that we can talk to um, technology sector to develop an app for women and girls with disabilities like a wristwatch that they can press when they are under attack. And emergency team will be able to reach them as quickly as possible. That's one. Secondly, we can, we can provide safe spaces. I have seen some NGOs doing amazing work in providing safe spaces for women. But women and girls with disabilities are excluded. And they are the most vulnerable on this. Do you know some men think they are doing a favor to women with disabilities when they say, I want to sleep with you, or they trust you in having sex with you. So we need to create awareness and sensitize the public about the sexual reproductive health rights of women and girls with disabilities. And I think the, the um, disability laws we have, we should advocate for the implementation because when we implement these policies and laws on disability, it will also reduce the hardship, the difficulties and the challenges and the needs of persons with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lois. That's so helpful. I'm bringing in another young woman, and this is so important for us as we take this conversation forward. Diversity has to be taken into consideration as we come up with strategies, next steps, and what we can do. And Nkiru, uh, just to put you on standby, I would want you to kind of give a quick wrap up of uh, some of the next steps and some of the uh, what we can do. Uh, as outcome of this uh, once before we round up. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to yield the floor to Cynthia Mbamalu. Cynthia is with uh, Yaga, uh, one of the leading uh, youth organizations in Nigeria. She's done a lot of work, especially around uh, governance and um, the democratic process. Cynthia, I want you to talk about how uh, violence against women in the workplace, especially young women in the but who are, for me, one of the most uh, vulnerable, including uh, uh, women with disabilities. Thank you, Cynthia. Yes, um, thank you so much, um, Funke, and it really has been a pleasure listening to the conversation this morning, and also my sister Lois, um, listening to her speak. But this is, a, this is a very important conversation, and sadly, 
from the civil society space where we think, um, okay, this is a space where there are lots of activists protecting and promoting human rights. And you believe at least women should be safer within the civil society space. However, that is not the reality. What, what, we, what we've seen are you have young girls who are beneficiaries of programs and most of them are sexually harassed by the sponsors or the leads in the organizations hosting those programs. You have, I've had on different occasions, I, I remember one of my staff actually came to report, she had gone to meet one consultant we're working with and the person was trying to touch her and all of that. She literally had to struggle um, away from, from him. And this is someone who is learned, who is a top researcher in the space. And so this is, it goes on even within the organization. You have first-time interns, volunteers who work within the organization. Some of them are harassed, promised of, oh, you, you'll be retained or you'd get a job or you'd be sent on a trip or you'd be sent on a training. But my worry is that most times these things are pushed under the carpet. Um, we have individuals who have not been hello, yeah, held accountable in this space. But how do we now address this issue? I, I believe that one, we need to have more organizations who mainstream sexual harassment policies, a diversity policy, and expand the whistleblower policy to also protect victims or survivors who make reports. And um, I, I, I don't know how this can be effective, but I believe if, for instance, donors and international partners engaging with organizations makes it mandatory, normally there's a focus on what's your financial policy and procurement policy, but also makes it compulsory that part of the policies that would be considered before grants are approved um, are the um, presence or a, um, that um, the organizations have these particular policies and that there's a system within the organization to address abuse and abuse is made. I think that can be a, um, a system that can checkmate that within the space. But um, so beyond the policy for me is also in the sector, we have older people who have been in the sector. We have people who engage on different fora. How do we ensure that when young women make reports or share their experiences that we do not shield these old individuals because, oh, they are our partners who We've worked for 25 years in the sector, so we have to protect them. There's this thing of trying to protect and shield, or we don't want it to live through society so that the politicians will not use us for a fun trip. But if we can't demand accountability in the civil society space, then why should we keep pushing for accountability in the governance of political space? So I also believe that is also it is a lot of responsibilities in, on leaders in the sector to actually start to take actions when young women reach out to you. Please do not ask them to keep their stories to themselves. Do not ask them to keep it down because you know politicians would use us. No, no, no. Rather encourage them to speak. Do not even question them and ask them, oh, hi, are you sure it was not him just toasting you and not like he was saying? You know, there's some kinds of questions you, you get, you're asked, and you begin to wonder, what do you mean? You know, this um, sexual advances that I did not welcome, I did not want people touching me, I did not want that, and you think we should keep that. So we've condoned this um, this thing within the sector and I believe this is the time for us for leaders in the sectors to actually be, be held accountable because they need to take action in protecting young women young women with disability in this space there's a lot of abuse that goes on that is covered up and I think for me lastly um, would also would, would also um, be a, a sort of peer I would like to say peer review accountability system. I don't know how to put it, where at, um, every, if we can have just, I'm talking for civil society space, because if I get into entertainment, that's much broader. But at this space, is it possible that we have yearly meetings or quarterly meetings to discuss these issues? And um, it could be um, a platform for all women leaders, if we want to make it that, or it could just be civil society leaders and partners just having conversations around um, sexual harassment in the workspace within the sector, and then having, um, doing sort of like a review mechanism. What, uh, do we have reports? How many reports did we have? Did we, um, what, what, what was done to address these reports? You know, that sort of accountability system that we review each other in the sector and we have that conversation. And then also considering introducing in organizations a, a work safe space conversation timing. I think 
you will have more organizations that it could be at different intervals where you have a space where anyone can say what they want to say, express themselves and not be and not have a fear of reprisal or losing their jobs or being blacklisted because it's also this thing in a sector where if you speak out or speak up your blacklist, especially if you're a young woman, oh, she's still, she's, she talks too much, she can't, she's not secretive or she's not, she doesn't have decorum. There's always this negative, this stereotype used to describe women who even speak up. So if we can introduce those kinds of space um, safe spaces conversation, because honestly, if we do not address these issues within this space, then we are, um, we are just, we're just pretenders and just a, a team of liars demanding accountability from government if we can't even demand accountability within this space where we should be those promoting and speaking up for human rights and gender rights, actually protecting women within the space and within the sector. But once again, thank you so much. It's been an interesting conversation this morning and noon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cynthia. That's very helpful. I want to give the panelists another minute each to just go around each of you and to just uh, um, say last words. Uh, some of you, I would ask questions as your last words. For Professor Chioma Goma, I'm going to be starting with you. And your question is, uh, you did give an example of Microsoft, a case uh, of Microsoft and one um, uh, AGK Maduka. Are there other example, uh, best practices or existing policies? Of course, I know your own story that um, uh, Nkiru had shared, uh, but in terms of this workplace culture, workplace culture rather than just laws, these practices and culture against sexual harassment, even when there are no specific laid down rules or laws, but just a culture that is against sexual harassment and all forms of gender-based violence. And I'm speaking now in corporate organizations, in, in, in institutions of higher learning, which is your forte. Can you share this? Yes. Yes, uh, I've already posted that, yes, University of Lagos has a sexual harassment policy. Uh, I've been privileged to chair uh, one or two, at least more than two panels involving issues of harassment. Okay, and one of them was particularly very sad because the person that was harassed was a very senior member of the organization and she reported to the chairman or the chairperson, a woman herself, very senior member of the community, who told her to keep quiet because her husband was a professor. And this festered for a long time and this uh, the perpetrator kept on doing it, kept on doing it until eventually it got to that committee and was able to go back to find out exactly what it was. And it was because of issue of harassment. So my uh, question is, or my take at all times is, end this culture of silence. There should be zero tolerance for sexual harassment or violence of any type. I've had a mother who came to complain about the young daughter, very brilliant. So why should anybody harass her? Yes, somebody was harassing this girl and the woman didn't want it to escalate. I said, don't worry, ma'am, I will deal with it. I had to call the person involved and said, what you are doing? He tried to deny it. I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I have gotten the information. And he agreed and that ended it. The other one, I said, put it on speakerphone so that the other person, the person reporting to me, I said, put your phone on speakerphone so I can hear the other person's voice. And when it happened, okay. I went straight to the dean and said, dean, I have heard the conversation. I've heard the other person. If no action is taken, I'm escalating it. And that Thank was you so very we must, much, bro. We must all do our own bit in our own space. Zero tolerance. Thank you very much, Prof. This has been really helpful. Um, I'll go to Ms. Habib Babalogun. So can organizations then choose to be more progressive uh, by dealing with issues that these laws fail to address? And then what are the gaps in the sector that we need to then work towards addressing? Yeah. I mean, um, I think a, a lot has been said here and we've got a lot of solutions. I mean, what has come to my mind as we've been going through all of this is that I think we need to have a wider range of consequences. Clearly, people's comfort level with the consequences of reporting is not high. So we need to give them a wider range of consequences. And this wider range of consequences is available for organizations. So organizations have policies and organizations can decide that if they investigate and find out that there's a case and it's proven, they can talk to the person, make the person go for counseling. They can suspend the person. They can call a mediation and make force the person to apologize and make a commitment that, it, that that behavior will stop and that if there's a repeat, 
he or she will be sacked. You know, they have a wider range of options in, in terms of how to respond and how to respond than when you go to report to the police or when you go to report to, I don't know what happens at the, at the university level. I think we need to give some options for victims. I don't want to say victims, survivors. We need to give some options to survivors where they can report and they know that it's not the worst case scenario. The person is going to lose their, his or her source of income because that will be a major deterrent. So the societal pressure on them that look at all the guy did was, and now his entire life is ruined. His entire family's life is ruined. He cannot earn an income. And I think it is when you have, and of course, I'm not talking about rape. I'm not talking about rape. Of course, if we have rape, that person should be put away. And I'm talking about other cases of um, along the spectrum of sexual harassment. I think we need to make, try and eliminate some of those barriers. So that's on one hand. What are the options? And then the other hand, culture, I think the solution is here about funding um, the creative sector to make films, to tell appropriate jokes, to educate, to sensitize. I think is very, very important. That is when we're going to see some headway. I think there's already enough work going on and other organizations are pushing the work on the legal side, on the policy side, and um, on the having safe spaces, uh, um, places that women and children can go to. Um, Thank you. And things like that. So, Thank you very much. Yeah, let's make it easier for people to report. To report. Yeah. To Thank report. you. I'll come to you now, Mr. Voke. Your last words and at the back, uh, as you as you give us that, please, how do we think uh, the National Assembly as an institution, you know, can help to make reporting easier? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think it's been a very useful conversation. And like uh, the other panelists have said, it, it, it can be further uh, moved forward. But quickly, I, I look at four areas of education capacity building, research, and advocacy. Now, the National Assembly can make laws and, and, and that's where their mandate is. Then when these laws are made, the civil society space can educate people on these laws and help people to understand these laws. And this can then translate to policy that will be in workplaces on how best not to run foul of the law that the National Assembly has made. Then this law will come by way of capacity building for different cadre of people on how, first even for the National Assembly, how to work with the executive in terms of implementing the laws that the National Assembly have made. In making these laws, we need a lot of research. I, I, I read the, the research, now what was, what was written by Habiba on the findings from what C. There are a whole lot of things that we can find out from research. And if we are able to put this together, it will certainly enrich the narrative, the conversation that where we go. And then we can end this by very clear and well-articulated advocacy. For example, the Senate has passed the sexual harassment bill. The House have not passed it. It will be for this, a uh, bill to become law, it must be passed in the House of Reps, then it, there must be concurrence before it can be signed into law. The civil society friends can support the House of Reps to also uh, uh, commence the process of passing this bill and even making it more robust, more all encompassing than the one that was passed by the Senate, and then we have a concurrence and have a very robust law that will address all the issues that have been raised here. And I think this is the way to go. Then we can do serious advocacy for, comp for both, the, the, both the, the, the formal companies and the informal uh, uh, investors, for them to internalize these processes in their everyday practice. I think the whole story is that synergy, synergy from government, both National Assembly and the executive, and from civil society and the media. And for us to begin to talk about these things and generate a lot of attention that Thank you it doesn't very much. anybody to oppress women, to victimize women. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We've taken a lot of your time, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephanie, the closing words as we look at how to implement some sort of code of conduct in the entertainment industry that frowns at uh, objectifying women and violence against women. Yes. Stephanie. Down to one thing that everyone has said. So, as lawmakers, as this, um, uh, the professor, every other person is working behind. The main thing is, if people don't change, if people don't change their behavior, we're like back to ground zero. So, like everyone's saying, with all the wonderful work that everyone is doing, work that awareness work that everyone is. Doing. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Awareness. Okay. Awareness. People need to know what they are right. What they are. So if people are more self-aware, they will do better. And everyone's because you will know when someone is sexually harassing you, and you also know when you're sexually harassing someone, so that you're not in between. So you're not like you have to educate people to the point that they know that this is a no-no. So because some, <clears throat> so you, you don't hide behind like oh I didn't know, but you have to constantly put it in their face. You don't do this, you don't do that, you don't. So the, the people probably change their behavior, and we in the internet, even at the AGM level. I think the guilds are also putting up some laws within the cement industry or as a guideline to also protect people who work in that space and also some of the contents we put out. But we as filmmakers want to put out educating content and also will help create enough awareness to make sure that we change the culture of silence in our society. Thank you very much for that uh, closing words, uh, Stephanie. Nkiru, over to you. So thanks everybody. I, I think this has been so informative and impressive. I'm really honored to be on this panel with all of these amazing speakers. I can't believe I'm on the panel with my, my boss, my former boss. So it's like amazing. Yay, Professor Prof. So for me, one of the things, I, for me, this is personal. At African Women on Board, we started it because it just got too much. Like everywhere you went to, there was somebody re not really chasing you around the table. There's always somebody looking for your trouble, you know? And then you're driving on the streets of Lagos, your policeman is pulling you up aside and, you know, they tell you, I have two of you at home. You know, those things, we're tired of it. And so for me, it's particularly important that we do not keep silent. Um, I, I, and I think the onus is not on the young women because we're saying to them that they shouldn't really go on social media. They don't trust, they don't, I mean, how, where should they go to? There's no trust. When you have a senator who is, you know, a, 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 a public beater of somebody and is still there, why should they report to anybody? You go to the police, they tell you, oh yeah, now come to the back. Like, you know, the judges tell you, both men and women tell you the same thing. Why are you here? Now only you, Waka, come. Has it, is it just, it's a normal thing now. Why are you talking too much? I've heard judges say that. So how do we expect younger women not to name and shame and go to social media? It's our daughters, it's our sisters, it's our nieces. Of course they have to go to social media. You know, we're the ones who are training these boys. We're the ones who let the girls go and wash plates and then the boys, you know, uh, you know, king. We're the ones who are doing this to our own system. So I, I don't believe in this whole, oh, let's report. Ms. H, I hear you, but I don't think reporting is going to make any change. You know why? Because think about the backs. The culture is from down, is from up, down, down, up. Literally, who are you reporting to when the or guy is part of the problem? I mean, seriously, we're not. And then it's not just the men. The women and the women in the boardroom, like, ah, shh, we've been here before. If most senior women spoke up, I mean, how many women? You're 100 women. They're senior women, and they've all gone through this. But we're all keeping quiet. We're not saying anything. We're like, oh, sh don't worry. It's not only you. This is just how it is. If we don't speak up, it's not going to change. We're going to have this culture of impunity. The reporting isn't going to help. We're, you know, like it's not. And by the way, again, it's not just sexual harassment. It's all sorts of violence. It's all, you know, the abuse, the, 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 the taunting, all of that stuff together. You know, it's a belief that men are superior. And we as women also believe that. So it's the, it's the house, houses of religion, you know, whether it's Christians, whether it's Muslim. I, I believe that, you know, our culture was, you know, African culture was respected women. So we adopted religions and took some of these bad behaviors from, from, from these adopted religion, religions. You know, Christians don't come and murder me, but it's true. You know, your pastor is visibly 
you know, beating, sorry, harassing somebody, but like, oh, no, 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 God is, he's a man of God. Like, what is this nonsense, you know? So for me, really, it's really important to have these conversations. We must have open debates. But honestly, I feel like senior women, I, I really just they call out to senior women. Women, you've been there. You've been okay. there. You've seen it happen. And you're keeping quiet. You think the kids should be the ones speaking up. It's, this is so, so unfair. If more of us spoke up, if we all said yeah. what's happening, there will be shame. We must name and shame. If not even naming, let us at least name the behavior. Name yeah. the behavior. If you're not naming the person, name the behavior. Say it happened to you. If you're the CEO of a company, if you're a bank MD, if you are a, 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 a serving board member, stand up and say, a 60-year-old woman, come and say, this is how it happened to me. It has happened to me. Stop covering this thing. The more we keep covering, the more it keeps being. Which Thank is you, that for the year old Kiri is all fired I'm sorry for <laughs> I, yeah. know, I know how you feel about this. In Kiri. You're all fired <laughs> up. I know yeah. Stephanie wants to say something. Stephanie, yeah, I just want, let me I just finish want, at 12 30. This is 12. I know. I just wanted to add something, you know, because if it's a little bit, I, I want to add something. When we're communicating, because there's so many things we're doing, I think we need to change our narrative. And I know, Funke, I've spoken to you about that, that yes, when she yeah. talked about back in the days, the women, back in the days, you don't, if you beat to a woman, the whole women is coming for you. The whole village is coming for the man. And that's- more that coming. network, yes. Yes, yes. they come for you. And the men are controlling their own. The women are controlling their own. You need to be our sister's keeper. Yes. And like the, 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 the rapper the, network. Yes, and the African woman was never behind the man. They were side by side working to work together. And that's our sum of, so we need to change the narrative. So women, because what I went to a conference, I said, women, you're not helpless. You have all the powers. Okay. You have all the powers within you. Find that power. We are not helpless. So when we keep saying we're victim, we're, you have so much power. And those are the conversations. Those are the communication that we need to put out there. The power that lies within you that you need to rise up for. Because if you say stop, Thank I say you. stop, you say stop. The men so that's one of the things when we're changing the narrative these are some of the communication we need to start putting out there thank you stephanie yeah. i'm so glad this happened to you in kiru because you said we should do it for one hour 30 minutes i said this is always going to be fired up we need hours for this anyway uh i want to read my colleague dabasaki's uh, comment because i think it will close this session for me uh, we need to elevate conversations on the vicarious liability element of the microsoft case for management of institutions and employees to understand that when cases are reported and management fails to act, such companies to, and so our employer is also liable. But yeah. this, there's no better way to end this than to say, there has to be accountability. SGBV principles stand on three triple, triple, a, a, a triple of three legs. says prevention, accountability, and then support. First, we need to do all that we can to put in place measures where people who have power over the other or vice versa cannot exploit the other. You should not be able to exploit me in the workplace. I should not be able to exploit you in the workplace. The workplace should be a safe space. The home front should be a safe space. Society should be a safe space for women, for girls, for women with disability, for young women, for men, you know, for everyone to live together. When they then happen, because even when we uh, uh, prevent, uh, we're all human beings. Laws was, were made for man, not man for, for, for the law. People will break laws. There has to be accountability. There has to be systems in place to ensure that people, when they commit the crime, they do the time, regardless of where they are or who they are. Nobody should be allowed in parliament. And Mr. Voke, we are still coming to you. A video surfaced where this man did. What more evidence do you need? Yes. I'm thinking that if this man were in the opposition or were in, or a layman or a poor man on the streets, we will not be waiting for judgment in court. There was video evidence. I find it so disheartening. When we ask people to come out, that means even if I'm raped in public, even a senator was, was threatened with rape on the floor of the house, that man is still walking free and claiming to be an elder statesman. How then do we encourage young women? How do we encourage victims or survivors to come out? And this is me being like in Kiru and firing up. The third mm. is support. When these things then happen, we have tried to prevent, we have held people accountable. We should not forget the survivor. We should not forget 
the victims? What are we doing to rehabilitate them, to make them feel comfortable? They will never be able to get back to their 100%. But we yeah. should have systems and structures in place that ensure that they are protected, that they are not double victimized by the yeah. system that abandoned them or abandons them or make these things their fault. This culture of shame, the shame should go to the perpetrator. My dignity as a woman is not in my reproductive organ. My dignity as a woman should be in the entirety of my personality as a human being, not by virtue of my reproductive organ. So we as actors, and I'm not talking about you alone, Stephanie, actors in different fields, you know, we hold the key to ensuring that we end violence against women and girls. On this note, I want to thank all our panelists. I want to thank all our attendees. Thank you for your patience. I haven't seen anyone leave the room so far. Thank you for staying the course and for listening to us. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Oyo Oyemobi, who will give us a vote of thanks. I'm so sorry for keeping us uh, beyond the time, but you must agree with me that it's been very in, 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 you know, yeah. exciting and instructive. Oyo please take it away. Funke out. <laughs> Thank you, Fulke. So we have two, it's two minutes to 1 p.m. and I'm not going to say it so much. Apart from just saying thank you to our uh, panelists, it's been a very interesting afternoon. Uh, the conversation is so interesting that everybody, you know, nobody wants to leave the room. But I just want to say that as we go to lunch, one thing that I haven't heard so much of is what we can do as um, bystanders what we can do to support um, people around us. Every time that we hear or see uh, people being attacked, what can we do? And as we ease into this festive period, is a time to also reflect and you know, look out for those people who work in the informal sectors um, around you. They don't understand policies, accountability, all of this um, English that we have um, heard here today. But there's something that you and I can do um, to support them. So with that, I say thank you to our panelists one more time and to Nkiru and her team who had made sure that this uh, event had gone successfully. I want to say thank you Nkiru, Uzo and Inem. You are a wonderful team and we are glad to have worked with you. And to the rest of my team at Ford Foundation, thank you very much for all your support. And to the attendees, Without you, I don't know if we'll be having this session. And thank you for all your contribution. So this is one of the last um, learning sessions that we'll have for this year. And so we look forward to having all of you join us again in the coming year. Thank you very much and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. And our panelists, please just hold on for a few minutes. Prof, uh, happy bar. Stephanie, is she still in the room or she's gone? Just wanted to say thank you to our panelists. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, thank you for the incisive conversations. No hold bad, no holds bad conversations. <laughs> Mr. Voki, I particularly felt sorry for you because you were the one. <laughs> <laughs> on the spot and that's to tell you the the important role that government you know plays in in, in all this unfortunately uh as a government person uh you would always have to face this kind and thank you for handling it so well for being so gracious uh and and responding to all the questions as much as you can thank you professor gomo for bringing thank you for standing up on kiru uh for doing this work in your circle of influence, who would have thought that you would be here with your with your uh, subordinate now in the same conversation? Thank you, Habiba. Uh, your research, you promised to share it with me. I want to read it. Uh, please do. Well, thanks for your patience. I took a lot of your time, and and I'm sorry you dragged. Thank you, Shade. Thank you, Inem, uh, for uh, for all you do. It's 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 been. Oh, we still have some attendees in the room and I have started talking. <laughs> oh, maybe we should just... Oh, you're yeah. supposed to uh, turn off the, the um, Uzo. You're supposed to yes. turn off the pop. Yes. I'm actually even just uh, removing... One so I've, shared, I've shared an excerpt with um, Inkiru. So I've I shared it. 
Yeah, I'll share the full report with you. It should be ready very soon, yeah. actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll send it. What we'll do, we'll send it through via so everybody can get it on the mailing list. And okay. put the links to the search ready. That will be yeah, I've already shared it with the group. Okay, great. Great. That was super. That was super. Uh, uh, you know, my issue with social media is I don't want them to get away with it. Too often when people report on social media, instead of talk about the report they've made on social media, the people they are reporting about get away with it. They never actually make a formal report. And I don't think that's good enough. You know, there's nothing the National Assembly can do. There's Take a look at it. And uh, if you need to make input for the version in the house, it will be fine. And again, you can also know the 106 senators that supported the bill. And that the would be helpful. Yes, thank you. I'm I'm typing out my email address, Mr. Voke, in case you don't have it. Uh, but I think uh, also yeah. Yeah. Dr. Tibe has it. That was so, wonderful. Wonderful. That was really it. wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> I and that was why we we kind of gave it uh, the allowance of two hours, uh, just in case we we ran you know but because i was mixing the conversation i just wanted i just wanted attendees to feel part of the conversation and not just keep asking you all questions and then they just feel like bystanders and or all look yeah, at that was great, I think that also, it, was, it was great it was well yeah. organized thank great. you well modulated that's okay. great that's great at least i didn't run away with a fake headache in kiru you should be thanking your stars <laughs> that i didn't I'm so up so 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 i would have just said oh my head my head you imagine people will even be me and then you would have to uh, carry it on. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you so much. We will continue to, we always have these learning sessions every quarter. So please forgive us this week. If we come running to you again to have a conversation, this particular one, we did want to bring a uh, very important, uh, not that we're all not, uh, not important, but what I'm saying, we did want to bring very government people. We wanted to bring practitioners, people who have interfaced with these issues, people who know uh, what's happening. And, and maybe in the subsequent ones, we'll also then talk about it. My worry is the statistics that have been reeled out in terms of the informal sector and how we can ensure violence against women in scrub, especially with domestic servants. Uh, yeah. I also have a part-time company I run. I run an events management and I know that I don't even have an HR policy. But, you know, yeah. so that's me. Not to talk of the average, uh, you know, Kunle, Talabi and Chukuma, who also run different organizations. So anyway, we learn every day. I think there has to be a way to interface or engage with the informal sector to see how yeah. we can even enlighten them.